Okay. All right. Moving on to something a little bit more serious. This will be the 10th of 11 presentations I will have made by the time we get off in Florida. One more tomorrow in the morning at 11 o'clock on pirates. But this one is probably the most controversial of them all. And so at the very beginning here, I want you to sort of suspend judgment if you can, because I'm going to be talking for the most part about a, a time in the early 20th century when the world was very different than it is today. It was um, colonialism was sort of at the high water mark, imperialism and so forth. And it was a totally different time than we live in today. So what I will be doing today is relating to you the uh, series of interventions of the United States in the Caribbean area, cent including Central America. And um, it starting in the early, actually the Spanish-American War through uh, the end of the 20th century. But let's go start way back at the very beginning. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, George Washington visited Barbados at the age of 19. And he was raised in, in a provincial backwater uh, area in Virginia, and this was really his first exposure to the outside world. Back then, people thought that if a person had tuberculosis, they could move to certain locations and it would improve their health. So his brother Lawrence was suffering from tuberculosis, and they, they were in uh, Barbados for a short period of time, and he loved Barbados, overwhelmed by the beautiful prospects presented to our view. He nearly died of smallpox while he was in Barbados, and his face was uh, definitely marked for the rest of his life because of that. But this was a major turning point in his life, his visit to the Caribbean. And then we've heard a lot about Alexander Hamilton lately with the, the uh, show on Broadway, Hamilton. Um, the, he was born in the island of Nevis, which is right next door to St. Kitts, raised in St. Croix. And um, because of the second article of the US Constitution, he wasn't eligible to become president of the United States. Uh, that article states that a person needs to be a natural born uh, citizen of the United States. Um, and he may well have become president other, other than that uh, particular problem. But he did go on to become uh, the first US Secretary of Treasury and establish the financial system that has served the United States so well for a couple of centuries. Well, during the Revolutionary War, the Caribbean was a significant source of military supplies. Of course, France was an ally of the American colonies, so Martinique was a transshipment point for military supplies, France to Martinique and then to the colonies. But what people didn't realize is that Holland, although it was technically neutral, was engaging in a lot of black market commerce with the American colonies. What they would do is load up ships full of military supplies and sail towards Africa as if that's where they were bound. And then they'd shoot across the Atlantic to St. Eustatius or Statia. And that became a major transshipment point for military supplies going to the United States. In a 13 month period, 3,200 ships came to that little island for the primary purpose of selling military supplies to the American colonialists. And the colonial navy attacked Bahamas. I didn't know that until I researched this talk. Uh, the governor, <coughs> when he was reassured that they weren't gonna pillage uh, Nassau, Providence, um, he surrendered and the colonialists were able to gain quite a bit of military hardware. Monroe Doctrine. Monroe was our, the fifth president of the United States. And um, he established a doctrine that, in effect, said, <coughs> you European powers, uh, you can keep your existing colonies in the New World, but don't think about establishing any more. Don't consider any attempt to extend your system to our hemisphere. So that sort of laid out uh, some boundaries. Uh, at that point in time, the United States in its infancy was, was a fairly weak country, could not really have enforced that, but at least that was the doctrine that uh, he set out. Now, let's talk about Cuba, first of all. It's the island that is closest to the United States. It's only 105 miles from Key West to Havana, Cuba. Very, very short distance. 
And the United States, for the better part of the uh, 19th century, wanted to annex Cuba. In other words, it wanted to take it and make it part of the United States. 1807, Thomas Jefferson tried to uh, get something going with that, uh, talking to the local uh, Cubans. Of course, they were under Spanish power at that point in time, so he wasn't negotiating with Spain, but rather dealing with local agents. Uh, that didn't go anywhere. And then the uh, John Quincy Adams, he was Secretary of State in 1823. He said, Cuba forcibly disjoined from its own unnatural connection with Spain. Let me stop there. Look at this period of time. Most of the colonies in the New World had become independent by that time. Cuba had not. And so what he's talking about there, forcibly disjoined, in other words, once you have rebelled and thrown off the shackles of Spain, it would be incapable of self-support and can gravitate only towards us, the United States. And then later in the uh, 19th century, Secretary of State John James Blaine, Cuba must necessarily become American and not fall in under any other European domination. So for the better part of the 19th century, there was this expectation, or at least hope anyway, that Cuba would become part of the United States. Well, let's fast forward a little bit to the main incident. I mentioned this in one of my earlier lectures. This is the USS Maine, a battleship that was in Havana Harbor, uh, sort of looking over American interests there in 1898, February 15. An explosion took place. We s no one knows what caused it, whether it was a, a bomb or a boiler explosion. But at the, bo at the end of the, uh, the bottom line was the ship sank and the fingers were pointed at Spain. And there was a great desire on the part of the United States to go to war with Spain at that point in time. And a joint resolution of Congress was passed. Uh, McKinley was the president at that point in time joint resolution of war was passed. And now, interestingly, there was an amendment to that joint resolution called the Teller Amendment. And the Teller Amendment, in effect, said, the island of Cuba is, and by right should be, free and independent. Now, how do you, how do you balance that with all of this history I've just been given? Well, apparently in Congress at that point in time, there were individuals who, in fact, wanted Cuba to remain independent. And then there were a large block of senators and congressmen who did not look forward happily to the annexation of a large region full of people of color. And then there were the states that had sugar interests, um, where sugar originated. Uh, sugar cane in the south, sugar beets in the north, uh, Idaho area, and so forth. And they banded together and passed this resolution that said, hey, we may go to war, but Cuba will not become part of the United States and will not be accessed. So it was a total reversal of all of this movement towards annexing Cuba. Well, the war was over fairly quickly. Actually, it was over in three months. It didn't even last as long as you see up there on the screen. And I'm sure that you recognize the, uh, the fellow with the mustache a little bit on the side of the flag there. Teddy Roosevelt, that's him and his, his Rough Riders. Well, the war was over after three, three quick months of fighting, and um, it was time then to figure out where do we go from here? If we're not going to annex Cuba, and we are occupying the island of Cuba, uh, what should we do? Well, an amendment to a, an Army Appropriations Bill was passed in 1901 that established the conditions under which the United States would withdraw from Cuba. Number one, there would be a U.S. Navy base at Guantanamo Bay. And so that base is still there today. It's about the size of uh, Brooklyn. And um, we, uh, the United States pays the exorbitant amount of $4,508 a year to lease the, the uh, Guantanamo Bay. It's the, it's the oldest overseas naval base for the United States. And then there were a few other conditions um, that really sort of put constraints on Cuba, prevented Cuba from giving another nation control over its foreign affairs. In other words, the United States said, we will determine whether or not 
you should do this or that in relation to other governments. And it also gave the United States the right to intervene in Cuba for the sake of preservation of Cuban independence. So in other words, there were a lot of very broadly written uh, things in this uh, Platt Amendment that gave the United States some political cover for intervention in Cuba. And in fact, it did enter, the United States did intervene in Cuba in the 1906 to 1909, 1912 to and 1917 and 1920. So multiple times over the first two decades of the 20th century, the United States went into Cuba again. Now, at the end of the Spanish-American War, there were, in addition to Cuba that gained its independence, there were three other areas that gained their independence. Guam, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico. And all of them became U.S. territories. Again, the Teller Amendment kept Cuba from becoming a U.S. territory, but Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines became U.S. territories. So let's talk about Puerto Rico for just a minute. So it's sort of an interesting case. In 1917, Puerto Ricans became U.S. citizens for the first time. But it's not a state. It's a territory. And because it's not a state and a territory, they can't vote. They have a representative in Congress, but it's a non-voting representative. And they cannot vote in the United States presidential elections. They're not eligible for a lot of aid, $10 billion in additional federal funding, Social Security, Medicare benefits. So not being a state is depriving them of uh, quite a few benefits. And very importantly, and this is really important, government agencies and municipalities cannot file for bankruptcy. Why is that important? Because the island of Puerto Rico, the government and the various entities in Puerto Rico have $74 billion of debt. To put that into context, that's 70% of their gross national product. To help bring it home just a little bit more, let's say that you were taking home $100,000 a year in your gross salary, and you had outstanding personal debt of $70,000. You're going nowhere financially. And so that's sort of the situation in, in Puerto Rico. They really are in desperate financial uh, conditions. Their, their unemployment rate is something like 15%. Uh, and not only that, but in 1917, they were blasted by one of the worst hurricanes ever to hit the, the Caribbean, Hurricane Marie. Um, totally devastated the electrical grid system, and it was the largest power outage in the history of the United States, bar none. Fortunately, they are pulling themselves out of it. Apparently, electricity is now available throughout the island, at least in most of the places, uh, but they are still reeling from the effects two years ago of that hurricane. <coughs> well, let's talk a little bit about Teddy Roosevelt. You remember Kerry Big speak softly and carry a big stick. Well, there's the big stick. And he was carrying that stick in the Caribbean. We talked about Panama quite a bit. in a couple, I did in a couple of lectures, Tommy Sue in a couple of her lectures. But of course, the Panama Canal was really his main focus right at the very beginning of his pre presidency. And I'm just, this is, you've probably seen this information at least once or twice, bear with me for those of you who weren't there. Uh, Gran Colombia was the country at that point in time. They had a province called Panama. The United States thought they had a canal treaty. The legislature in Gran Colombia did not ratify it. And then the wheels in the background started turning. February 1903, revolutionaries began to plan for independence. Uh, by November, <coughs> a gunboat, the U.S. Nashville, showed up in Colon Harbor. Um, and boy, that was a very, very... If you were on CNN, there'd be all kinds of breaking news that week. November 1, gunboat shows up. November 3, Panama declared its independence. November 6, U.S. recognized the independence. And less than a month later, there was a treaty with a representative of Panama to build a canal and control a canal zone in perpetuity, which means forever. Well, there was a Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. And this is it, basically. The United States has responsibility for the entire Western Hemisphere, for preserving order, protecting life and property, and 
the United States can act as an international police power without the approval of other entities. There was no United Nations at that point in time. I think the League of Nations came along a little bit later, but um, at any rate, the United States in effect laid out these guidelines, at least during uh, Roosevelt's presidency, that we, the United States would be an international police force in effect. So let's take a look at something called the Banana Wars. <coughs> From the early 1900s until 1934, until Roosevelt came along with his good neighbor policy in 1934, the United States was very, very active throughout the, the Caribbean, in Haiti, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Honduras, and so forth. And the Banana Wars were really a series of ongoing military occupations, police actions, interventions. Now think about the period in time. Uh, the Second World War, um, 1915 or thereabouts, the idea that at least initially the United States was neutral in that war, <coughs> but they were very concerned about the intervention of Imperial Germany in the Caribbean area. So the idea was to discourage European nations, particularly Germany, from intervening. Protect the Panama Canal, brand new, it opened in 1914, so let's make sure that all the all the uh, lanes coming into it are well protected. And then definitely protecting American commercial interests. A lot of banks, a lot of companies had invested in this part of the world and protecting those interests was paramount for the US government. And then maintain political establish in some cases and others maintain political stability in the region. <coughs> so let's take a look at it. Haiti at that point in time 80% of the commercial interests in Haiti were owned by the Germans, either by the government or by individuals in Germany. So that was, an, that was something of grave concern. Again, we're talking about around the First World War. And so President Wilson, at, there had been a period of about four years prior to this where there were six presidents, uh, several of whom had been assassinated, all the rest had been sent into exile, total chaos, <coughs> President Wilson sent in 330 U.S. Marines. By the way, it was the U.S. Marines who were the intervening forces in virtually every case. So they rewrote the, uh, the Haitian Constitution to permit foreign ownership of land. Apparently, uh, that had been a restriction. It, somehow, Germany had gotten around that. They took over the custom houses, the banks, and na national treasury. In other words, they took over the entire financial system and then used that power over that financial system to pull off 40% of the revenue to pay off debts to American and French banks. In other words, it became very much a country under the dominion of the United States at that point in time. This is a picture of a Marine camp at Capatien and a picture of some Marines defending. There, were, there was some insurgent activity and so they, there was a, a certain amount of violence going on at that point in time. On the other side of the island, Dominican Republic, <coughs> similar kind of a situation. The United States, uh, in effect, took over the government and reconstituted the Guardia Nacional Dominicana, put in American officers to, to lead that national defense force. And these are pictures of Marines who were in occupation in the Dominican Republic. Well, while the United States was there, and, and it was a period of uh, about 15 or so years, in some cases just a little bit longer, of continuous occupation, a lot of infrastructure development took place. <coughs> Railroads and bridges and roads and so forth were built and improved. And you can, if you travel to Haiti today, you'll s still be able to see many of those infrastructure improvements. Canals, irrigation canals were rehabilitated to encourage the development of agriculture. Hospitals, schools, public buildings, and so forth were built. Uh, drinking water uh, was available in the main cities. So that went on for a period of between 1915 and about 1934 or thereabouts. At the same point in time, generally speaking, that same period of time, the United States intervened in Honduras seven times and Nicaragua 13 times, <coughs> excuse me. Now, in that part of the world, a couple of companies had major 
holdings. The United Fruit Company and the National Fruit Company both owned a lot of land and, and uh, had a lot of agricultural exports, bananas being among the most important, but they also exported uh, sugar cane and other products as well. And so in these countries of Honduras and Nicaragua, there was a lot of, of turmoil in the government, a lot of presidents being exiled or, or assassinated. And so the United States sent in the Marine Corps again. And this is a picture of, of the Marines. That's a horrible looking pirate flag there in uh, Nicaragua and in Honduras. Now, a few slides back, I said there were, there were four different reasons for the United States, the intervention of the United States in the Caribbean area. And two of them, one of them was protecting American commercial interests. Uh, a lot of companies, a lot of banks had invested heavily, and it was very important that they, those interests be protected. And so this particular individual was one of the key players at this period of time. He was at, by the end of, of his career, he had reached the rank of uh, Major General, <coughs> Smedley Butler. He started off uh, in the lower ranks at the very beginning uh, of this period of time, and he was in many of these hot spots, Cuba, Honduras, Panama, Nicaragua, and Haiti. He served in all of them in the Marine Corps, and his valor on the battlefield won him two U.S. Medals of Honor. So he was really sort of a hero uh, for the United States and for the Marine Corps. And now we're, we're going to address this question of did the banana wars protect American commercial interests? <coughs> and as you look at these quotes on the right-hand side, I think uh, there's a definite yes there. These are quotes from General Butler. I helped make Mexico safe for American oil interests. Haiti and Cuba, decent place for the National City Bank. Purified Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers. Brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests. And helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies. But one thing you need to know about General Smedley Bake, uh, Butler was that he was a very independent thinker, a very strong personality, strong opinions, and... This is how he felt about all of this. It was not a happy memory that he had. So, another one of the reasons for embarking on the Banana Wars was to bring political stability to the region. And was the United States able to do that? I think history clearly shows that it did. Political stability, not necessarily <laughs> democratic government. These were, in case you're not familiar with them, these were very um, brutal military dictators. With the exception of Duvalier, he was not military, but he was definitely brutal. So this is the period of time that we've been looking at from about 1906 to 1934. <coughs> and you can see that... Uh, during many of those years, uh, um, well, there's really not a single year in that period of time when the United States had not engaged in some kind of intervention. Uh, we're not talking about Cuba and Panama, just Haiti, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, and Honduras. Well, things changed when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt came to office. He initiated what's called, been called the good neighbor policy, and it's been called that because of this quote. Take a moment to read that quote. A neighbor who resolutely respects himself and because he does so, respects the rights of others. And so that was really, um, uh, uh, really a quite a, a large change from the uh, kind of circumstances and, and history that we've just been talking about. And of course, uh, a period of the Great Depression commenced and then the Second World War <coughs> and things pretty much stayed the same. There, uh, some of those dictators were in power during that period of time. 
but there, weren't, there wasn't much in the way of U.S. involvement in the Caribbean during that period of time. But since 1950, there have been a number of um, instances where the United States has been involved in the Caribbean. In 1954, um, apparently General, or rather President Jacobo Arbenz had initiated some land reform and some labor reforms. And this is the period of the Cold War, by the way, folks. I don't know if you can remember that far back. Um, talking 1954. And so the uh, McCarthy hearings were taking place about that period of time. There was a great red scare, so to speak. And there was great concern that uh, Jacobo Arbenz was under communist uh, influence and he was overthrown. Cuba. 1961 and 1962, I think we'll all remember this very well. The Bay of Pigs, April 17 to 20. Um, uh, the Bay of Pigs was planned during the President, uh, President Eisenhower's administration. And if you look at the date, that's about four months after President Kennedy was inaugurated. Uh, the planning took place under Eisenhower and it went forward under Kennedy and it only lasted a few days. Uh, President Kennedy had some severe misgivings and withdrew any air support for this operation. And at that point in time, the operation uh, was, was in effect over. And now this experience, this sort of confrontation between uh, the Castro government and the United States encouraged Castro to continue the process that he'd already begun of aligning himself with the Soviet Union. And that then led to one of the most frightening times of our lives. I, know I can say our lives because we are contemporaries and I, I can remember when it was announced that missiles had been found in Cuba and what a, I'm getting chills down my spine right now thinking about it. What a really difficult time that was, very frightening time. Um, a blockade was imposed, a quarantine of Cuba, to keep the Soviet Union from bringing, resupplying or bringing any additional missiles. I remember at this point in time, it was, uh, I was in high school in Balboa, and uh, the canal was, it no longer, for a period of time, it was not a commercial operation anymore. The entire U.S. naval fleet went from the Pacific to the Atlantic. So it was 24 hours a day, you could look at, at the canal and and U.S. naval vessels were streaming through the canal from the Pacific to the Atlantic. U-2s were flying over my home, U-2s that in the morning had taken off and flown over Cuba. And so this was a very, very frightening time. But fortunately, all things ended up well and the missiles were withdrawn. And so from that point on time, um, going forward, our relationship with Cuba has been very fraught, very problematic, our meaning the United States uh, relationship has been very difficult. Uh, in 1963, travel restrictions, could not purchase any items that had plus 10% Cuban content. In effect, uh, Cuba was, was sort of put a, a cordon around it. There, was, there would be no commercial uh, or personal interaction with Cuba. Uh, and that went on for quite a few years until 2011, um, President Obama, Obama was in power at that point in time, and independent travel was permitted for the first time in five decades. He visited Havana in 2016. Direct flights went to Cuba for the first time in 2016. In 2018, President Trump uh, sort of pulled things back a bit and restricted travel to 12 categories of travel, things such as um, family travel, humanitarian projects, educational, uh, research, support of the Cuban people. <coughs> I can't think of all 12, but those are some examples. <coughs> and my wife and I were in San Fuegos, Cuba last fall because we were on a Holland America Line uh, cruise. I was presenting uh, lectures on that cruise and we were able to, we and all of the passengers were able to go into San Fuegos. And many of you perhaps have gone to Havana uh, in the last few years. But uh, just five days ago, uh, President Trump announced that only family travel will be permitted from now on. They haven't written up the regulations and so forth, and there's a little bit of ambiguity. Um, I did some 
last time I was online just a couple of days ago. I wanted to see if there were any updates to that, and uh, there were none. So uh, this is all I know at this point in time, but I'm not, it, it looks like uh, f for the next foreseeable future anyway, <coughs> cruises to, to Cuba will not be happening. So let's talk about the Dominican Republic. In 1965, this is President Lyndon Johnson's administration, Rafael Trujillo, who had been dictator for 30-odd years, was assassinated. And that assassination led to a great deal of political chaos and bloodshed and so forth. And President Johnson was very concerned about Cuba, in effect, taking over the Dominican Republic. Sent in 22,000 U.S. troops. Um, it, apparently, there wasn't a lot of bloodshed, not a lot of violence, and uh, they were able to restore order very quickly, and they weren't there for a long period of time. Then some of you may remember uh, during the uh, administration of President Reagan, Operation Urgent Fury, it only lasted for three days, and what we're talking about now is Grenada. <coughs> uh, Grenada's Prime Minister, Maurice Bishop, right there in the center, and on his right is uh, Manuel Ortega of Nicaragua, and on his left is, of course, Fidel Castro. He was assassinated, and the, the Reagan administration was concerned about 600 medical students who were studying at a, a medical university on the island. He was concerned that they would be held hostage. The Iran hostage uh, crisis wasn't that uh, far in the rearview mirror, and so he was very concerned about that. Sent in 7,600 troops. The Marines landed here in the 75th Rangers landed in near St. George's, <coughs> restored order very, very quickly. There wasn't much bloodshed at all. So it was one of these surgical operations that was over very, very quickly. And then, very close to my heart and my home, Operation Just Cause. Again, it didn't take very long, 12-20-1989 to January 3, 1990. But what had happened is this, this customer here, this bad guy, by the name of Manuel Noriega. He was on the payroll of every intelligence agency in the world, as well as every major drug cartel. He'd become extremely wealthy and arrogant. <coughs> he killed, beheaded his main political uh, competitor. Uh, they were going to have an election, and then he arranged for the uh, assassination of his main competitor. He finally took it one step too far. The United States had um, a group of soldiers who were in Casco Viejo, where we were a few days ago, driving by the uh, National Guard headquarters, National Guard being their combination of police and, and army. Uh, they were identified and stopped by the National Guard. They turned around and drove back to the canal zone. A shot was fired. Uh, one of the individuals was killed. And at that point in time, war was a reality between Panama and the United States. President H, uh, George H.W. Bush was the president at that point in time. And so Operation Just Cause began, <coughs> and it was uh, very convenient that military bases, uh, airfields, and so forth were right there and available in the canal zone. And it wasn't long at all before Manuel Noriega was apprehended. Now, just a little side note here, and it'll be very short. I was talking to someone who was in charge of the intelligence group that was trying to hunt down the leaders of the uh, Noriega and his second-in-command and so forth. And over a period of time, uh, a, a story developed that everyone loved to repeat that Noriega took refuge in the legation of the uh, Vatican, the Vatican legation, and in effect had... He was in, in a diplomatic facility and therefore could not be uh, taken out. <coughs> and the story, as the story goes, night and day, 24 hours a day, uh, Black Sabbath, Pink Floyd, um, all of these, these rock groups that, with their hideously loud music, it was played 24 hours a day surrounding the legation. And finally he gave up and came out and surrendered. He couldn't take it anymore. Well, according to this, this fellow who actually was on the inside, um, there was a little bit of truth to it, but not much. Apparently, the uh, 
Noriega would send his representatives outside of the legation to communicate and negotiate with U.S. authorities. And there were news organizations that had uh, devices that could overhear the conversation, very highly technical devices. And so in order to disrupt the sound waves of that conversation, this music was played. So it's not quite as much fun as the first story, but that's the way it goes sometimes. Well, Noriega, of course, was arrested, <coughs> spent uh, hard time in uh, a jail in Miami, went to France, extradited to France, served there, came back to Panama, and we passed by the penitentiary next to, Bal next to uh, Gamboa, where he spent the last years of his life, and he died a year or two ago of old age. And now, ending on a very happy note, the U.S. Virgin Islands. A little bit of background on the U.S. Virgin Islands. I know many of you have been there and enjoyed them very much. Well, they were under the, they belonged to Denmark. And let's look at this date again. 1917, what was going on? The First World War. And the United States was concerned that Imperial Germany was going to annex Denmark and then set up U-boat submarine bases in the Virgin Islands that belonged to Denmark. And in order to forestall that, before that could happen, the United States negotiated with the government of Denmark and purchased the islands for $25 million, uh, $400 million about in today's dollars. And that, that was a good deal. I love going to uh, the various uh, Virgin Islands. So I hope that uh, you have enjoyed this lecture. Oh, by the way, one more uh, slide here, Danish flag. After 250 years, 51 years of colonial rule, it was lowered 31 March 1917.